Welcome to another episode of the Scott Santon's UBI Enterprise. So this time, I'm going to get back to the book Tyranny of Kindness. And whereas last time I read the first almost couple chapters of part one, this one is the fifth chapter, which is the first chapter of part two. And the reason I want to make sure to get this chapter out there as well as I did the first couple chapters is that this chapter gets into something that I really hardly ever see anyone talk about. It's almost become kind of its own sacred cow, which is the nonprofit. Uh, poverty industry. So people think that they're doing something really good when they donate to a nonprofit uh, focused in the poverty space, or they work or volunteer somehow in this space. And uh, it can be true, but really it's not necessarily true. And in fact, this is a system that perpetuates itself. There is so much money being donated to nonprofits to fight poverty in various ways. And so much of this money is really funding not the the poor people. It's not supporting the people it's supposed to support. It's supporting this system that is profiting off the existence of poverty. And in doing so, it's really helping to perpetuate poverty. If we really wanted to eliminate poverty, we would take those resources and just provide them directly to poor people. People need income, people need cash, and when they have that, they're able to use that. All of the stuff that we're doing besides that is just an excuse to not solve poverty. And in fact, I get into something, or this chapter gets into something called the discard market, and I wanna make sure people understand what that is. Because really, when you get down to it, corporations are writing off garbage as a tax deduction. And that garbage is being fed to poor people because, hey, garbage is better than nothing, right? So this episode might upset some people to think about this in a way they're not used to thinking about. I think it's important that this be heard. Tyranny of Kindness, Part 2 Filling the Gap, a Charitable Deduction. The toughest adversaries of welfare mothers who organized for their rights were often those in the, quote, not-for-profit charity organizations. These functioned in a kind of vulturian relation to poor people. Their very survival depended upon the existence of poor people. In theory, they were allies. In fact, as agents of the status quo, They couldn't sell poor women out fast enough, or buy some, advertise them in their promotional literature, and parade them around like tamed savages, living testimony to the power of social work. Sometimes they were even well-intentioned. Class and cultural barriers combined with their paychecks made it all but impossible for most to understand poor women at all, much less to represent their interests. Active welfare mothers who tried to hold on to their own agendas without getting walloped by the helping hands were universally skeptical of the do-good agencies. They had all been helped at least once too often. The money in the other person's pocket tainted their relationships, as one's well-being was predicated on the other's lack thereof. A welfare mother and activist from Minneapolis dubbed one of her group's functions as, quote, non-profit prevention work as if she were talking of rape or disease prevention. I heard stories of deceit by the charities from poor women across the country, California, Massachusetts, Illinois, New Mexico. Why did these things happen like a recurring nightmare shared across great geographic spans as if by magic? Because except to poor people themselves, poverty is mega business. In the guise of serving the poor, a triad of interests converge. First, there are the mediating institutions, the so-called not-for-profit agencies. These are the giant charities that have multi-million dollar endowments and real estate holdings, and that get the lion's share of tax-deducted charitable dollars and human service government contracts, as well as the thousands of smaller ones that vie for a cut, often in the hope of becoming one of the giants. These tax-exempt entities overtly and covertly influence government social policy in behalf of the poor through public interest advocacy for programs they want foundations to start and the government to sustain. They exist outside government, 
have their own boards of directors, their own constitutions, known as bylaws, and their own missions. DWAC was a small nonprofit corporation, albeit one of few made up of and run by poor women. Second, the for-profit corporate sector and wealthy individuals who inherited from their ancestral prototypes fund nonprofits either through the foundations they originated, like Ford and Carnegie, or directly through active current donations. In addition to lowering their tax burdens, a primary objective is to affect public policy to their perceived advantage, including to spawn future government spending programs. This is usually accomplished by seeding, giving initial, initial money to, nonprofits that will produce studies that support their contentions and run models based on the studies. The process can also be initiated by the nonprofits whose fundraisers convince donors of the merits of their programs. The third element in the triad is government. The models I just described are meant to be copied by other nonprofits around the country, at some point creating a sufficient mass to convince government to take over their funding in whole or in part. This creates an even greater incentive for additional nonprofits to adopt some variation on the model. The competition for government contracts soon becomes highly political, and the model, which may or may not have been a good idea in the first place, is long forgotten. Among the government monies recently taking this route are those for drug treatment and those for fighting hunger and homelessness. Elected officials and their surrogates, the agency bureaucrats who distribute the money nationwide, become powerful in direct proportion to increases in the amounts of money they control. The nonprofit corporations interface with government through rotating staff positions, depending on who is in office, and with profit making corporations through interlocking directorates and sometimes staff positions. To complete the circle, the corporate sector endorses and funds the campaigns of politicians who have been helpful along the way. The nonprofits create awards and covertly provide troops to aid in future political campaigns, a very significant element in the larger picture. The entire process is represented as filling an essential social gap that government has heretofore missed. For instance, knowing welfare benefits were too low for people to live on, instead of lobbying to raise the grants, these shakers and movers of public policy developed a nationwide network of soup kitchens and food pantries. Poor people have no say and are left out of the process, but live with the consequences, good, bad, or irrelevant. Collectively, along with AFDC, Social Security, Medicaid, and other government-administered entitlement and service programs, the programs of these independent concerns constitute the welfare state distinct from small W welfare, or public assistance per se. The media wrap it up for the others by sloppy reporting and out-and-out -out endorsements or acknowledgments of the agencies, polls, and benefactors. The welfare state is not new to the late 20th century, but the non-profit service sector has never been richer in terms of share of the gross national product and jobs, more powerful or less accountable. It is the only significant power block that is essentially unregulated, in spite of the fact that most of its money comes from the government through either direct service contracts or tax expenditures. Its influence over public policy has mushroomed since the 1960s. It has become a veritable fifth estate. Taxpayers foot the bill. Poor people suffer the consequences. In recent decades, this fifth estate has been costly in human as well as fiscal terms. The boulder that propelled the avalanche certainly preceded the Reagan administration, contrary to the claims of most liberals. The tendencies had been in play through most of the 1970s. A few of the actual cuts facing recipients that came out of Reagan's White House were proposed in Carter's failed welfare reform bill. Some nonprofits were hit by federal cutbacks under Reagan, too, but for the most part, their budgets were sustained or even increased by a combination of local government grants, foundations, which helped fill the newly perceived gap, and donations by individuals with the money to make a difference. Contrary to popular belief, in the aggregate, nonprofits actually experienced increased funding in excess of the rate of inflation even during the Reagan administration. The point is that Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981, engineered by our boy Stockman, was really a reshuffling of the deck. In the now infamous Atlantic Monthly interview by William Greider, Stockman revealed that the scramble to preserve special interests in the budget process was comparable to pigs of the trough. He said the only ones unable to get there would lose out, the poorest people. Lose we did. Whether trough or table, we weren't sitting at it. 
we weren't writing any part of our own agenda. Neither Democrats nor Republicans, liberals nor conservatives, mainstream nor fringe were listening to us. When it was over, tens of thousands of welfare recipients were cut off the rolls. Hundreds of thousands had already minuscule grants and food stamps reduced. Millions were thrown into turmoil by barbaric administrative requirements to jump through more hoops than all the trained lions ever on earth put together on the same day could have managed. Federal cutbacks to states became yet another excuse for state and local governments to reduce cash benefits to welfare recipients. The endlessly documented result was a dramatic retrenchment from economic justice and the concomitant surge in poverty, both depth and rate and homelessness. What money states did get, they wanted to distribute equitably among the social welfare agencies, not to poor people. During these years, I was there, a virtual double agent for poor people in every conceivable position that would allow an insider's peek at some aspect of the welfare state. After DWAC, I worked in a foundation, followed by a stint as, as a special assistant to the New York State Commissioner of the Department of Social Services, the state apparatus that oversees the administration of welfare, Medicaid, and so on, and service contracts that are parceled out to the nonprofits. Subsequent to that job, I set up a subsidiary of DWAC called Social Agenda, which was motivated by a continued desire to advance the positions of people who experienced poverty in the public realm. I also spent time on a fellowship which landed me in the middle of an enlightening experience with the New York State Legislature. Before and after that, I was a consultant for a number of social welfare agencies. Chapter 5. City Silos and the Pop-Tart Connection the rise of food banks and soup kitchens in the 1980s was part of the nation's eroding commitment to provide an adequate income for all families. This reintroduction of commodity distribution was a step backward from food stamps, which in themselves were a retreat from income relief. The commodity programs first emerged during the Great Depression, when farm prices dropped so precipitously because of overproduction that farmers could get less for their produce than they'd paid for the seed. This had been happening for decades as farming methods produced abundance. But it wasn't until unemployment spread like wildfire after the stock market crash of 1929 that the interests of farmers were put together with those of people who had no money to buy food. Local governments began purchasing commodities. Shortly thereafter, a national program came to be administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. By the late 1960s, the program had a well-documented, horrendous, and sometimes hilarious track record. There were many and apparently insurmountable difficulties. For one, items distributed depended entirely on the vagaries of the market. If honey were overproduced, it would become a commodity. Many people who had no use for honey would get enormous containers of it with virtually no hope of consuming all that sugar. Peanut butter came in huge quantities too. It is nutritious, but difficult to eat much of in the absence of accompaniments like bread. The commodities program was erratic in every sense. Most poor people received nothing at all for varying reasons. If a family without transportation lived far from a distribution point, they couldn't pick up what little was available, and so on. The program was finally iced because it served too few of the truly needy, gave too little to those it reached, and offered unusable items to others. Except for institutional purposes such as milk to schools, food stamps replaced commodities during the Nixon administration in 1974. But poor activists didn't want them, they wanted cash. Indeed, in the years preceding their introduction, the National Welfare Rights Organization, NWRO, campaigned against food stamps because of the inevitable stigma attached to them and the complications that would and did arise in their administration and daily usage. Increased cash assistance would have eliminated all of that and the need for yet another bureaucracy and more red tape. The stamps had advantages over commodities, however. Families with food stamps had at least some choice in their acquisition of food. The stamps would also be more effectively distributed among poor families. In spite of the stigma attached to food stamps, the initial red tape they involved, and the minuscule quantity each family received, most people were not sorry to kiss the commodities program goodbye. Absent more income assistance, food stamps were better than nothing and better than government surplus. For the time being, wide-scale commodity distribution was essentially over. Still, poor activists often continued to be at odds with food program advocates when it came to food stamps. 
The endemic conflict came to roost during one meeting in Washington toward the end of the Carter administration. By this time, increased cash assistance seemed light years away. The participants were a larger than usual mix of welfare recipients combined with advocates and lawyers from the Food Research and Action Center, FRAC, and the incipient National Anti-Hunger Coalition. We were to be visited by two or three congressmen, each of whom supported a bill to cut our food stamps less than some other politician proposed, as if cuts were a fait accompli and now they were dickering over the price. FRAC advised us to be nice. I didn't see it their way. Why be honey-tongued with someone who is introducing a bill to cut food stamps for the second time in the Carter administration for most recipients? I can't remember exactly what I said. I do remember the fallout. With a patronizing air, Jeff Kirsch from FRAC stepped in to apologize for my bad manners. Roxanne Jones, a former NWRO leader, now a Pennsylvania state senator, petite black and to the point, interrupted Kirsch, white and male. She set off a chain reaction of welfare mothers, spewing acid. He should never, never have contradicted a welfare mother in front of an outsider like that. These guys were, after all, talking about cutting what little we already had, and the idiots running the show wanted us to thank them. I guess Kirsch figured he could get away with it because I was white. He never did fathom the common ground we welfare mothers shared. He wasn't the first. He wouldn't be the last. We proposed organizing to stop the cuts. We asked for assistance from FRAC, which at the time was heavily funded by the government. A resounding no accompanied claims that they weren't allowed to organize or assist any groups engaged in political organizing. As it happens, agencies like FRAC and the Legal Services Corporation reached the pinnacle of their federal funding under Carter. Crossing the line on this and similar issues could have cost them some real bucks. Whether it was food stamps in this instance or welfare benefits in others, our lobbyists were funded by the same Congress that was proposing and cutting our benefits. Imagine the tobacco companies hiring the American Cancer Society to lobby for them. Once again, it became eminently clear that without our own voice, we were at the mercy of a crazy arrangement. We couldn't count on the FRACs to voice our interests. When the commodity distribution issue started to unfold, we knew right where all of them would be standing, under whichever money tree was dropping coconuts. In the meantime, there was work to do. On May 9th, 1980, DWAC did its part by sitting in and liberating lunch from the cafeteria of New York's branch of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Demonstrations of varying kinds were also held in Atlanta, Chicago, Springfield, and Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Baton Rouge, Phoenix, Great Falls, Montana, Wichita, Kansas. The lack of help from FRAC had not impeded our objective. Food stamps were temporarily in reprieve. There was no doubt that FRAC took the credit for speaking out for the poor. The Rise of a Tyranny of Kindness it was in January of 1977 that Philip Toa, then commissioner of the New York State Department of Social Services, called for a return to the soup line concept of welfare. He heralded it as the cheapest way of feeding the poor and claimed it would reduce public assistance expenditures. Soup lines were a throwback to the Great Depression when people with neither food nor money stood in long lines to be fed from huge cauldrons. Toa argued that part of the responsibility for human services being handled by government should be turned over to voluntary agencies. His speech was made at a meeting of the New York Public Welfare Association in a Syracuse, New York hotel. It was an awesome charge. The lack of outrage among the room full of concerned charity types was deafening. Maybe they all had calculators in their heads, telling them how implementation of this plan would position them for increased government contracts. Or maybe they worried about putting the contracts they already had at risk if they balked. It was probably some of both. As the word spread, it would be hyperbole to say that opposition from the panoply of professional good guys was muted. Toa's statements dramatically marked the retreat from issues of social justice that was brewing even before the election of Ronald Reagan. Acceptance of the principle by social welfare gurus all but handed Reagan carte blanche on poverty issues. The cuts that hurt poor people occurred at the same time that a liberal conservative consensus was developing on the propriety of and need for more volunteerism and charitable acts. Without understanding the consequences or even imagining the hidden agendas at work, many liberals especially were ready at the starting gate. Soup kitchens and food pantries began popping up everywhere. 
Politicians loved it, particularly the cost savings part, which was never uttered in public again. Television news producers were thrilled. Potential volunteers loved it, especially on Thanksgiving, when they, the politicians, and the journalists suddenly infested soup kitchens like maggots in garbage. It should be renamed I Love the Poor Day. Trouble was, the entire food movement was based on a false set of assumptions. We tried to insert our views. It was senseless to treat the problem here the way it would be treated in countries where there was simply no food at all. In the United States, food was and is in everyone's refrigerator, if they aren't poor, that is. It is in grocery stores everywhere. You cannot go out to dinner in any thousands of restaurants and imagine that food scarcity has been in any way a problem here. Ours is not a nation without food, but one of vast, embarrassing abundance. The issue of individual families' poverty could not be solved by returning them to the Stone Age of breadlines. Establishing institutionalized begging sites was never a solution. It wasn't food that was missing. Poor people lacked the normal means of access, money. Anything other than that would become a means of further separating the haves and the have-nots. Anything else would be a moral heist of poor people and a hell of a waste of time and resources. A mass movement of many kinds of people quietly but quickly emerged. If there was one thing they agreed on, it was the need to evolve a secondary or discard distribution market for poor people. The sheer diversity of interest that became entangled was mind-boggling. The only people who didn't cash in, the only ones absent from the debate in any public way, as ever, were poor. It was not for lack of trying. We were the tree falling alone in the forest. The advocacy that produced the nightmare stemmed from two major strains, food advocates and environmentalists. The former were motivated initially, at least, by the naive and arrogant notion that they could somehow feed the hungry if they just pulled their acts together. The latter were aroused largely by a concern for the environment. To them, it was obvious that overproduction of all kinds of goods on a grand scale was environmentally unsound, and a minimum, depleting scarce landfill space. Both strains converged on the idea of getting leftovers to poor people. Some of the lay advocacy community lauded the dual principles of sparing the environment by pawning off what would otherwise become garbage onto poor people and feeding the hungry. There were also those who saw dollar signs floating in this one. Fat tax write-offs for the corporations, grants for the local programs, a ride to the moon for advocates of the sorry developments. There were as many ideals and ways to help as there would come to be ways to fund them. Groups in the western part of the nation were charmed by the notion of gleaning and advocated a return to the ancient practice of allowing poor people to scavenge, glean, the fields for leftovers once the saleable and edible crops had by and large been harvested. As one who had gleaned from grocery store garbage bins before locks were put on them, I knew where they were coming from. For that matter, when I lived upstate, I even gleaned from the better garbage dumps. Nonetheless, I could see this was not a reasonable solution for the mounting millions living on the edge with fewer and fewer resources to fall back on. It couldn't, wouldn't, and ultimately didn't work for the huge majority of poor people, especially where there were no farms. There weren't even your usual grocery store throwout bins in the poorest neighborhoods. The corner groceries sold the same old stuff to the smells roiled even the rats. Middle and upper class people lobbied, raised foundation funds, sponsored walkathons and celebrity events, placed public service announcements on TV, and bought ads in such small town papers as the New York Times. All this and more they did to help. Had half those resources been put to work for income security for a decade, by now there would be less poverty, even if the goal of guaranteed income were not yet in our grasp. The nationwide bonsai of the discard market exploded in the early 1980s into a demand that the government release food stored in silos around the country. These were products kept off the market to prop up farm prices. The advocates argued that it was wasteful to maintain those commodities with hungry people in every corner of the nation. Maybe so. But before the advent of food stamps in 1974, this method of distributing food had been standard for years. 
Soon the far greater shortcomings of the commodities program would once again become all too apparent. Now that commodities were to be reintroduced on a grand scale, a new cast of characters emerged. Sweet young things, usually white, played right into the hands of behind-the-scenes power brokers. With the media almost lockstep behind them, they fought vigorously to introduce commodities to the hungry. The advocates had little to no awareness of the historical underpinnings of the commodities programs, no real communication with the people they sought to help, and usually no real idea what poor people would say if asked. In places like New York, where organized groups did exist, they were ignored. By 1981, the hunger advocates were rewarded with the birth of TFAP, originally the Temporary Emergency Food Assistance Program, changed in the 1990 Farm Bill to the Emergency Food Assistance Program. This program first became the bureaucratic conduit for big, orangey-yellow, cheese-looking stuff transported to locations across the country. Often those who accepted it were ill-prepared to distribute it. Sometimes whole loads would sit unrefrigerated in hot weather for days, just waiting for the local community action program or church group to get their act together for the distribution. The stuff carried a cigarette-like label warning people with high blood pressure and heart disease of the dangerously high sodium content. African Americans are disproportionately represented in the ranks of the poor. It was well known and documented that they also have greater rates of high blood pressure and heart problems than whites. Getting a five-pound block of this stuff with worms in it was not unheard of. People would not notice until at least some of it had been consumed. Needless to say, DWAC and RAM were not amused, at least not until the Cheezettes made their debut outside my window one tranquil January night in the early 80s. It was my birthday. Startled, I heard a megaphone. Give me a C! And a crowd shouted, C! Give me an H! An H responded. I went to the window and there were staff and members of DWAC and RAM dressed in cardboard boxes, painted orange with green letters, shouting and dancing. When the neighbors started complaining, the Cheezettes bumbled upstairs to my living room, singing a medley, beginning with, If it says surplus, 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 on the label, 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 you don't want it, want it, want it, on your table, table, table. Gripped by a sort of tyranny of kindness, do-gooders all over the country were mobilizing to bring someone else's garbage to our tables. At first, we joked about the scheming advocates. We referred to their efforts as the Table Scraps Are a Right campaign, T-S-A-R. We thought we were exaggerating. We were wrong. Corporate Greed, the IRS, Desert Share, and the Garbage Barge. The discard market for products that couldn't be pawned off from the general public was shot from a cannon. It is now a highly organized system. At the top is Second Harvest, a national cartel located in Chicago. It is a not-for-profit corporation controlled by some of the biggest consumer product manufacturers and distributors in the country, among which are Kellogg Company, the Stop and Shop Companies, McDonald's Corporation, Monsanto Agricultural Corporation, Procter & Gamble, and others. Second Harvest claims to distribute literally tons of food donated by corporations to approximately 200 food banks. These city silos supply the food soup kitchens and food pantries that popped up all over the United States during the 1980s. These in turn developed their own institutional base. At the beginning of the decade, barely a handful existed. By the end of the decade, there were in excess of 40,000. They were among the true growth industries of the 1980s. All people alive at the time and over the age of 10 had to know about these developments to some degree or another, even if they didn't comprehend their significance. Soup kitchens provide actual meals, usually cooked nearly always to men and some single women, rarely to children or families. Funny, even in poverty and without wives, homeless men would get A, the most actual food, and B, cooked food, free of charge. For that matter, more of the nutrition, money, has been targeted to places serving single men or the elderly than to poor families. That's why, try as they might, TV journalists in whatever city always report increasing numbers of children coming into the soup kitchens while cameras pan a sea of mostly men. They are searching out a kid to photograph on some holiday. When and if they find one, the cameras pause. It's called objective journalism. 
Food pantries, by contrast, carry mostly uncooked items, given to families on the presumption that they have cooking facilities available. Many don't have working appliances or have the utilities cut off. They are not asked about this. Pantries far outnumber soup kitchens as women and children weigh in heavily on the poverty statistics. As often as not, the smallest ones are operated by unpaid volunteers, frequently poor themselves. The pantries receive the least funding or product of the network. At each level of the discard market, the players calculate and pursue their interests, using economic and political power to achieve their ends. Poor people are the shills, otherwise irrelevant to the process and exempted from the real dividends. Second Harvest also reaps the benefits only cold cash can deliver. Most corporations on the board give hefty cash donations to Second Harvest. These, plus government contracts, individual contributions, and other grants provide Second Harvest with about $14 million annually to operate. The cash is used to pay for salaries, rent, computers, accountants. Second Harvest assists the corporations by taking products they cannot sell because they have reached their pull date, have been poorly packaged, short-weighted, or overproduced, or are market failures or otherwise damaged. Before the meteoric rise of Second Harvest, most of these items would have been dumped at the corporation's expense. Now the corporations get a tax break for much of what is actually garbage, while spreading transportation and environmental hazards to other places. It is most certainly in the interests of a variety of corporations to see that Second Harvest thrives. This is how it works. Corporation X overproduces meat tenderizer and is unable to sell it to the supermarket chain that usually buys it. Before Second Harvest came along, X would have dumped it because it was taking up space needed for new products. Now they give Second Harvest a call. An employee there checks the computer for a food bank, City Silo, that will pay a nominal fee to Second Harvest for it. Hopefully this will be the bank closest to the source. They give the bank a call and tell them X has a truckload of meat tenderizer that needs to be picked up. This food banker is reluctant to take it, especially since he knows it will be hard to hawk to the food pantries and soup kitchens in his area, but he caves. He then sends truckers out to pick it up. He calls other banks on the East Coast in the hope that a few will take at least some of it off his hands. He manages to get rid of about half, trucking it out to the other banks. The rest is unloaded and stored by the food bank and is listed on the inventory sent out to the K's and P's. The kitchens, which serve prepared meals, primarily to single men, can use a little, but not nearly enough to get all of it out of the warehouse. Although the pantries realize that people coming to them for food have no use for it, a few agree to take some. The pantries distribute mostly dry goods to poor families. It is bagged for distribution anyway. Of course, there is no meat in the bag. Six months pass, and the banks have cases of meat tenderizer left over. Finally, they dump it. Up and down the East Coast, landfills are paid by the food bankers for the right to throw away Corporation X's garbage. In fact, a good deal of the second harvest is dumped by the banks off the top. This takes up valuable local landfill space and passes the direct cost on to the food bank. The entire financial burden is ultimately carried by taxpayers, one way or another. The corporations win, coming and going. Second Harvest is not a warehouse of any kind. Second Harvest is a set of polished offices with computers that unite donated things with warehouses that will take them. Not infrequently, corporate donors toss Second Harvest items that are of no use even to the discard market. If Second Harvest or any of their subsidiary food banks cannot unload the items, the trucks holding them become like the infamous New York City garbage barge, moving along with unwanted cargo, normally known as garbage. The little muscle gets it unloaded bit by bit, as a favor to Second Harvest. Second Harvest claims to have received the equivalent of $404 million in cash and kind donations in fiscal year 1991. If this is true, it makes this relative newcomer the third largest charity in the nation, ahead of even the American Red Cross. Second Harvest arrived at this total by valuing every pound of goods received at $2.10. Of course, that's preposterous, but it sure leaves a lot of room for creative bookkeeping for the nonprofit itself 
and the corporations dodging taxes. I should note that $2.10 in 1991 dollars is $4 in 2019 dollars. John H. Bryan Jr. put it most succinctly in his 1986 keynote address to Second Harvest's annual conference. Bryan is CEO of the Sarah Lee Corporation and chairman of the Grocery Manufacturers of America, both of which have seats on the Second Harvest board. According to the glossy multicolored annual report, Mr. Bryan spoke of three long-term benefits to corporate social involvement, the first and most obvious being tax incentives. Another is the need for a business to support a community from which it draws its workforce. Third is a concern for corporate image. Said Brian, I am struck by how strongly Second Harvest satisfies these motives. I doubt that any charitable cause could better serve the motives of corporate giving. Corporations are not the only donors of unused stuff. In a moment of misplaced generosity, the General Services Administration announced that $3.6 million worth of the surplus from Desert Storm would be turned into a second harvest bonanza. From the aptly named Operation Desert Share, at last poor people get a cut of the American pie, the bounty of military procurements. This time the military will do the shipping. Second harvest's task is to match goods in banks and to sell themselves to the media and by extension to potential donors once again. The bucks won't stop there, however. Operation Desert Share is slated to provide up to $300 million worth of food to charities across the nation. To boot, many of the corporations benefited by selling the goods to the military in the first place. How nutritious is a can of locale soda, anyway? Nutrition, in fact, appears to be irrelevant to this discard market, in spite of slick literature that drips with charitable impulses. Donors are led to believe Second Harvest plays a major role in feeding the hungry nationwide through the gathering of donated food. Nutrition is assumed, but much of what gets distributed is not food at all. Like any big industry, the cartel has its secrets. Sometimes they can be ferreted out. Close inspection of their annual reports gives up a few. For instance, in small type, an apparently random list of items distributed appears under the heading Food Groups by Pounds. In 1986, the largest single category on the list of donations to Second Harvest, printed near the bottom and labeled non-food items, consisted of 17,103,163 pounds. Meats, fish, poultry appeared at 695,235 pounds, directly above the non-food items. A careless reader might confuse the two, but make no mistake, the ratio of non-food items to meat, fish, poultry was almost 25 to 1. Fruits and vegetables combined also weighed in at less than non-food, 14,650,606 pounds. Dessert, snack foods, and crackers and cookies weighed a whopping combined total of 31,086,877 pounds, although they were divided into three categories dispersed through the list. Snack foods alone, for some reason distinguished from crackers and cookies, was the second most plentiful bounty distributed by Second Harvest in 1986. Spices condiments outweighed three other categories combined. The list was organized by neither weight nor alphabet. It was certainly not organized by types of goods. If anything, it appears to have been organized to obscure the facts. In 1989, Second Harvest employed slightly more sophisticated, though equally random, reporting methods. The year-end report used percentages instead of pounds as the measuring device. Non-food items were broken into three separate categories, so the total didn't stick out. Combined, they were 9.9%, coming in only slightly above beverages at 9.1%. Inventory tapes sent out monthly by the local food banks are even more revealing. For months on end, until shortly after it was published in newspapers, New York City Silo, Food for Survival, and others carried microwave browning spray, purportedly supplied by the Second Harvest System. The Food for Survival inventory sheet read, Buy one, get one free. Meat marinade appeared frequently, also, but virtually no meat. Locale sodas and seltzers scored big time. And assorted gummy bear candies appear to have been easier to come by than any foods rich in protein. The single most consistent actual put-it-in-your-mouth-chew-and-get-some-benefit-from-it food is pasta. It is the only item on the Food for Survival list that usually appears with quantities limited beside it. I have never seen any form of pasta sauce on the lists, unless meat marinade qualifies. 
On June 11, 1991, a Food for Survival press release announced the donation of 500,000 jars of baby food by Beechnut Corporation. The release did not say the jars were past their pull date. The inventory sheets didn't mention it either. On August 21, 1991, the only meat or vegetable on the list were in the jars of baby food. Fruit could be found in the baby food, in the dessert section as frozen fruit bars, and in the snack section as fun fruit snack. Some produce, however, wouldn't show up on the inventory list because it can be donated and must be moved on a daily basis from major markets with leftovers. Food for Survival also gets huge grants to handle government surplus. The quality and consistency of food the government purchases are often far superior to that proffered by second harvest. Even so, the options are limited. Dry milk, applesauce, green beans, apple juice, and pinto beans were the only state surplus on the inventory list for August 21, 1991. One former employee said approximately 60% of what Food for Survival gets from Second Harvest is dumped. Bill Bowling, director of a food bank in Atlanta, says 40-50% to 50 of Second Harvest product is dumped. There is some internal logic for accepting it, according to Bowling. Often, a corporation, directly or through Second Harvest, will offer a bank large quantities of assorted goods at a time, which the bank will take knowing they will have to dispose of some amount of the delivery. Bowling says the rest is usable, and if you turn down the lot, the food bank might end up with nothing at all. Recently on a radio call-in talk show in St. Louis, I said that the numero uno ingredient distributed by food banks was sugar, and that meat or protein foods were all but non-existent. A board member from the St. Louis area food bank called in defense of the donations given by the corporations to food banks like hers. If a, quote, if a butcher makes a mistake cutting a piece of meat, he can always turn it into some other sellable thing, like hamburger. But if he short-weighed a box of Cocoa Puffs, there's nothing to be done except throw it away or give it to the poor, end quote. I asked whether her primary motivation was feeding poor people or protecting the environment. For a moment, she hedged, then acknowledged that as an environmentalist, her first concern was getting rid of garbage by passing it on to poor people. On a similar show in Cincinnati, a woman who said she'd taken a needy friend with five children to a pantry called to say she was shocked to find cottage cheese in the bag three weeks past date. The bread was moldy throughout. There wasn't enough to feed the entire family any real meal, but they were, she said, grateful for what we got. The city silos even developed their own language. Take food. True, mothers complained, what good is a box of spaghetti with nothing to put on it, or cereal but no milk. Pop-tarts were commonly derided. How about hamburger helper but no hamburger? And odd little items like mint jelly that nobody liked. When the Reagan administration announced ketchup would be counted in the school lunch program as a vegetable, myriad discount market proponents wildly and appropriately trashed the idea. Every television station, newspaper, every medium outside of Mars seemed indignant. Maybe they think mint jelly is a fruit. Protein is as rare at a food bank as pig's snout is at Le Cirque. Actually, the discard market almost universally warehouses many items of dubious nutritional value like microwave browning spray, MSG, and hair conditioner. With the dirty secret slipping out, insiders have taken to calling inventory product. The word food is spoken only to outsiders, like donors. I've yet to see the invitation to give money to a food bank leave out the word food, substituting product in its stead. One might ask why those who produce the garbage are not required to stop producing it. Or one might suggest that short-weighted boxes of Cocoa Puffs be sold at a lower price to those who want them in grocery stores. Or one might ask how a tax deduction can be taken on something that can't be sold. If it can't be sold, it has no value. At least that's what they tell us when we demand that women's labor be counted in the gross national product. The American taxpayer is footing the bill through tax deductions for these mistakes now slithered into a sophisticated IRS dodge courtesy of places such as Second Harvest. Turning a head of lettuce into an ounce of gold. You can give a mother 50 cents to go and buy a head of lettuce on sale. Or you can send a head of lettuce through this crazy system and keep increasing the original price as it moves, both literally and figuratively, through layer after layer of do-gooders. 
Forget the human cost, the obligation to eat or obtain food for your children at institutionalized begging sites. Hypothetically, a store decides the lettuce is too wilted to sell. Instead of throwing it away, it donates the head to a food bank. The store gets a tax deduction on a formerly valueless product. The food bank, which handles the product, has salaried staff, trucks, and equipment paid for either by government grants or by donations from some other source, on which that source gets a deduction. Let's say the lettuce was valued at 50 cents for tax purposes. According to a food banker in Rochester, produce costs him approximately 40 cents a pound to handle. Now the head costs 90 cents without factoring in the tax expenditures the very existence of the bank creates. He in turn sells that head of lettuce, which happens to weigh exactly one pound, for 12 cents to a food pantry. Now we're up to a dollar two cents. They too add an operational cost. We could be up to a dollar 42 now. The layers of government bureaucrats who are paid to oversee the myriad programs operating this way add yet more. This head is beginning to cost perhaps triple the original store price, but since it was deemed unsaleable in the first place, just how much is it worth? If by the time it reaches the pantry, it is determined to be unsafe for consumption, it is dumped. The garbage must be hauled and a fee paid to the refuse removers and the owners of the landfill. This too is on the government tab, both for the carting cost and because the pantry's tax exemption takes a cut off the dumping bill, which may not have sales or service tax. The denizens of this discard market proudly proclaim that hundreds of millions of pounds of product move around the country via this route. One thing is certain, a poor mother shops just like anyone else, or more frugally, when she gets a chance. No head of lettuce would go home in her bag if it cost three times the price she could get it for just next door. It gets even crazier. Sometimes a donor will pass product through the Second Harvest Network, even though it could be and once would have been donated locally. Second Harvest pressures donors to deal directly and only with them. Second Harvest locates the food bank closest to the source. The bank pays Second Harvest. Then local pantries and kitchens who want the product must pay the bank for it, when in the past they might have gotten it for free. Thanks to the user-friendly Second Harvest system, formerly free product now has value added at every level as it takes a journey, albeit mostly by computer, halfway around the nation only to return home. And every ticking minute of every worker's time and share of overhead costs from the moment Second Harvest gets that call is charged to all of us. The real beneficiary is the system itself and the tens of thousands of people who have become employed through this secondary market, each with a stake in its preservation, especially the upper echelons. Food for Survival's executive director, for instance, is paid over $60,000 annually not counting health benefits, pension, and other perks of being an executive. Not bad for the starvation industrialists. At any given point in time, there are 35 to 40 people on the staff of this single food bank. Expanding the donor base. Second Harvest entices new companies to donate with Madison Avenue style publications detailing the advantages that will accrue to them. One of these is a glossy, multi-layer portfolio within a portfolio called The Benefits of Donating. The middle has the usual well-crafted hype, advising companies of the value of giving unsaleable merchandise to Second Harvest to feed the hungry. Quote, donors contribute product to Second Harvest for a variety of reasons, such as labeling errors, product formulation errors, warehouse damage, overruns, and products that are discontinued or approaching code dates. End quote. In other words, Second Harvest attempts to acquire solely those goods that would otherwise be dumped. In donor profiles, Second Harvest proudly records one company's history with them. Kroger is a growing high-profile national retail supermarket chain with nearly 1,000 stores in major metropolitan, metropolitan areas in 17 states. Commitment, 
Kroger accepts a position on the Second Harvest Board of Directors in 1982. By 1983, Kroger implements a donate, don't dump company-wide policy concerning surplus product by its stores. Late in 1985, Kroger Company uses its resources as an experienced marketer to raise the public's awareness of hunger and food banking. The program garners extensive national and local attention through advertising, public service announcements, and in-store promotional materials. In June of 1986, the promotion earns Kroger an award from the prestigious President's Citation Program for Private Sector Initiatives. Is it mere coincidence that tax-deducted corporate donations virtually quadrupled from 1975 to 1985? An IRS-driven garbage market is one sick way for hardened capitalists to distribute essential goods, but that's just what we have. And neither the IRS nor any other government agency keeps any real track of these transactions in the aggregate. In the back pocket of the glossy is a sheet labeled Tax Benefits. Second Harvest, through all previous pages, has invited corporations to donate those items they would have had to pay to dump. Now they tell them the bonus. At a minimum, the garbage turns into platinum, as donors are allowed to double the cost of producing it for reporting to the IRS. Even this come on was sweetened by the Tax Reform Act of 1986, increasing the potential deductible yet again, primarily by changing some very modest paperwork connected to inventory costing rules. And that's if they play it fair and square. Overestimating the quantity and quality of the don donations is endemic. Since Second Harvest is valuing the dubious donations at $2.10 a pound, the corporations could be doing it too. Procter & Campbell knows a good thing when they see it. Their designated spokesperson, James Berger, listed the benefits as savings in transportation expense. The food banks have to pick up donations wherever they are at the company's convenience. Disposal savings, and of course, the tax benefits. Procter & Campbell's way of computing the deduction hinges on the fair market value, or what the product could be sold for. Though some food bankers readily admit to dumping large amounts of Second Harvest product when they first receive it, there is a technical catch. If the company admits they are donating totally unmarketable products to Second Harvest, they have to dance around this fair market value issue in the unlikely event that the IRS ever stops to take a look at this system. Procter & Campbell does the donating business with Second Harvest alone. Both institutions are nationwide, which makes it easy for P&G to get pickups wherever the excess product is. Second Harvest is clearly discreet. P&G is also confident that Second Harvest will be careful to keep seriously damaged goods from going out to people. Why would that matter unless Procter & Gamble is not so careful about what they donate? Incidentally, Berger works with Frank Smith, vice president of P&G's chemicals division and a board member of Second Harvest. Berger said that among other donations are samples used in market and research testing that are left over when the project is done. Surely these items were never intended for sale to anyone at any time. Sounds like potential garbage to me, and potentially dangerous, but it can't be called that or it wouldn't have a fair market value and couldn't be written off as a tax deduction. Second Harvest rarely turns down any of P&G's potential donations. According to Berger, 95% of the time, they can be convinced to take whatever it is. Procter & Gamble needn't worry, though. The IRS doesn't audit to determine if the donations are in fact food and in fact edible, or at least usable. All Second Harvest products are logged in as donated goods. Second, lists of inventories show many non-food items, useless items, and overproduced items from banks accepting Second Harvest product. Third, Don Roberts of the Public Affairs Division of the IRS says that unless a corporation claims a deduction for individual items valued at over $5,000 each, like a painting, the IRS would never audit its charitable deductions. In the discard market, none of the individual donations is worth more than $5,000, except for cash donations given for things other than food, like the $50,000 Second Harvest gets annually from Procter & Gamble. All are for cans of this and cases of that, or even pallets of something that might be totally infested upon receipt, which prompted the donation in the first place. Procter & Gamble doesn't have to worry about damaged goods hurting someone either. That's been covered by the Good Samaritan Laws passed in the early 1980s by every state and Washington, D.C. These are safeguards against lawsuits in the event that a donor's product injures someone. 
A publication by Share Our Strength says, Second Harvest is currently working on developing a national Good Samaritan law that could serve as a model for improving state laws, just in case. Berger smartly addressed the issue of non-food items by naming the ones that many mothers would welcome, like baby diapers, pampers and loves, toilet tissue, Tide, and cheer. He argued that if mothers get items like these free, they can spend their money, their other money, on food. What other money? I have never seen any of these choice articles on a food bank inventory list, but it's certainly possible somebody somewhere gets some. As for no-calorie soda and the like, Second Harvest can't always get what they want. After all, companies only donate what they choose, according to Berger. In other words, things they don't need, won't sell, and don't want to pay to throw away. Pilferage One issue that does concern Berger, apparently, also concerns some of the other donors, goods that come back into the primary market. When Second Harvest distributed a questionnaire to a conference sponsored by the Grocery Manufacturers of America, attenders were asked to rate Second Harvest services. 58 responses were returned. Second Harvest was rated 100% on courtesy and cooperation, and another 100% on assistance with product recall. At the bottom of this list was product reentry prevention capabilities. Second Harvest scored only 84% on that. They dropped from A plus in genuflecting to B in keeping the stuff from being resold elsewhere. Given that conference goers tend to be soft on their charitable interests, assume that the 84% positive rating represents a conservative estimate of the suspected filching, 16%. If so, of the 476.4 million pounds of quote food, Second Harvest takes credit for having distributed in 1990. More than 76.22 million pounds may have been diverted into the black market. Institutionalizing an expensive distribution apparatus certainly does not prevent pilferage. Some paid workers at the site skim the cream, as it were, for themselves. Workers virtually everywhere take something home, even if only a sample of this or that, but this or that was not intended for them. True, many aren't paid much, and some at the level of direct service not at all, but many didn't need either the money or the free products. At one New York City Council hearing, it was, re it was reported that donated food was surfacing in restaurants. Toilet paper has been sold by the case on the crowded streets of Chinatown. In Chicago, it was reported to have landed in grocery stores, too. In Cincinnati, one felon claimed to be running a food program for former prisoners. Each week, he ordered cases of various goods, promptly picked them up at the food bank, then sold them at a flea market. This is true even in the for-profit world, where almost any warehouse worker could tell you stories if so inclined. This system must be awfully tempting for the corporations, the bankers who sign off, even the handlers who might wink. Fooling about feeding the poor. At the top, everybody's winking in some way. After all, Second Harvest claims an incredible, downright ludicrous cost-benefit ratio. Approximately $162 worth of food was distributed for every dollar expended. Not likely. Much of it isn't food. Much of it ends up in the dumps. Much of it is stolen. The weighing is often rigged, and the valuation excesses and tax deductions are not taken into account in this figure. Second Harvest also claims to have distributed 476.4 million pounds of food to 42,000 agencies across America in 1990. This poundage includes donations directly received by local banks, which is more than half the total. It also includes the other product, the non-food items and low-cal soda by weight, and stuff that gets dumped. Also, Second Harvest food banks distribute goods to nonprofits that serve not poor people but a more middle-class population. Even taking them at their word, still, they would only be donating 15.8 pounds of product for every poor person in the country annually. Who would that keep alive? So any realistic evaluation of the importance of this cartel would have to leave some big question marks, especially since it costs billions to run all of the programs spawned by the system. It would take years and a census squad to compute the actual total with any certitude if it ever could be done. Besides the handful of adults, mostly men, who frequent soup kitchens, the number of so-called meals available through this private system 
is so restricted there's barely a soul alive because of them. As Christina Walker, a longtime food distribution activist in New York, says, they could close them all down tomorrow and no one would starve. They, the garbage advocates, have learned how to tell the big lie, and they do it all the time to raise funds. Because some of what is distributed is in all likelihood poisonous. The opposite is likely. Managing the managers. After the cheese stuff was done and the butter ran out, there wasn't much left in the rural silos. In the meantime, one by one, city silos, food banks, were becoming established. With walk-in refrigerators and freezers, sophisticated offices, and sprawling space for dry goods, these massive warehouses received donated goods to be dispensed, for a modest price, to the direct givers, the soup kitchens and food pantries. There are over 200 city silos spread around the country. New York State alone boasts seven. The city silos are not volunteer operations either. The budget for just one can run into the millions annually. Again, the budgets are generally not to buy food. In fact, Second Harvest discourages food buying among its member banks. Not all food banks are part of the Second Harvest system. They argue that buying food puts the network in competition with itself. So, except for the fees paid to Second Harvest, food purchasing is verboten. The money pays for employees, executives, secretaries, comptrollers, bookkeepers, laborers, truckers, and trucks to move the items, whopping rents, refrigerators, freezers, everything to institutionalize a crisis mode. Even public relations specialists and fundraisers are hired by the banks. Glossy pamphlets to aid and abet the projects do not come free. The same advocates who wailed about the costs of storing commodities in real silos didn't so much as splutter over these expenditures. For most, they had become their bread and butter. One of the country's most successful food banks is New York City's Food for Survival. The local sites to which they are supposed to deliver complain that deliveries often take place on days when they aren't open. With a budget of over $3 million, this fully computerized operation replete with beepers for drivers ought at least to be able to coordinate their deliveries. Food for Survival's biggest success has been in raising money, mostly through government contracts, not in providing services. As far as management goes, the story internally nicknamed Turkeygate tells it all. In the 1991 holiday season, a sort of share the wealth scheme was dreamed up by Food for Survival's director, Lucy Carrera. Because FFS almost always has hundreds of thousands of dollars more than they need to operate, they would purchase thousands of turkeys and distribute them free to the K's and P's in a display of largesse. According to former employees, some of the turkeys were bought wholesale at 89 cents a pound. Virtually every retail grocer in the country was selling them for less. Inexplicably, FFS also acquired some smoked turkeys for $1.19 cents a pound. It gets worse. Some of the turkeys were refrigerated, with the intention of distributing them first. Others to be given out later were stored in a huge walk-in freezer. Apparently, workers began distributing frozen turkeys while fresh ones were left to sit in the refrigerator. By the time the costly blender was discovered, the frozen turkeys were gone and the refrigerated ones were spoiled or near spoiled. Those that could not be pawned off fast on local operations that had the wherewithal to pick them up themselves were dumped. No public announcement was made about Turkey Gate. New York City government's bone to the poor is lovingly referred to as EFAP, Emergency Food Assistance Program. This program began with a $450,000 appropriation in fiscal year 1984. In 1991, the city budgeted $1.98 million for wholesale food that was stored and distributed by Foods for Survival to the K's and P's exactly three times a year. You might think that since virtually all the sites designated for the three EFAP deliveries are already sites for other programs, which FFS also handles, it wouldn't cost much to tag on the EFAP product. Nonetheless, nearly $900,000 went from EFAP to FFS for administration or what the city refers to call, prefers to call, operational costs. For every $2 worth of additional food FFS distributes to sites already in their comp computers and on their routes, the city is charged $1 more for the service. 
At each level of the discard market, the players calculate and pursue their interests using economic and political power to achieve their ends. Poor people are the shills, otherwise irrelevant to the process and exempted from the real dividends. Local food barons managing the poor. At first, getting the cheese was easy by red tape standards. Previously, a family merely had to show up. Once diversification and salaries came into the game, the pantries, followed in short order by the soup kitchens, started imposing restrictive practices, which they could be ruthless about. In government terms, for all practical intents and purposes, they have been totally unregulated concerning what they give out, who gets it, and how. So, from what authority did their rules flow? Themselves. Many of these places act more like the welfare department than the welfare itself. Screening, forms to be filled out, lists of undesirables who are not to be helped are kept by some and passed around. Severe restrictions were put on how often people could come to the pantries, most frequently reported three times a year. No matter how bare their cupboards, referrals are often required. Some soup kitchens insist on authorized ID cards. The big ones give out numbers to people as they line up, allowing only a few in at a time. Rain, wind, snow, or sleet does not change the regimen. The rest wait outside. Most kitchens open for only one meal a day, and rarely more than five days a week. Many open for one meal one day a week. Some pantries open no more often than a few times a year, when government stock arrives. I was almost as naive about these operations as anyone. For quite some time, I actually believed that what was being stored and distributed was, was a massive quantity of wholesome, real food. The question I asked then was, why not just let poor people go in and take what they need? The flip answer was always that someone would hoard and someone would sell the stuff. Stealing would be rampant. Poor folks just can't be trusted. Not like someone with a salary well above the median. When did honesty become a class trait? Repeatedly, poor mothers would say, just give me the money and I'll feed my own kids. For many, transportation expenses to a site cost more than the value of the food itself. In other cases, the food was inedible anyway. One common reaction to the notion of giving mothers the money directly has always been, if you give them the money, how will you know they will spend it on food? In light of the monstrous developments in this discard market, I'd have to ask that question of them. For that matter, if you give the hunger activists the money, how do you know they won't spend it on their Christmas parties replete with booze? I've been invited to many paid for by taxpayers over the years. Almost all nonprofits have a direct or indirect entertainment budget. Poor, or rather hungry people, as the industry likes to call them, are not invited. Instead, poor people get shafted on the taxpayer's dime. The discard market acts as if the tightrope they dangled product on were really a lifeline. By its own inflated accounting, however, in New York, the actual meals served per poor person barely tallies one every two months. The meal count can include hair conditioner, deodorant, and Snickers tacked on to lesser quantities of pasta as everything is counted in pounds or dollars worth. Then it's divided by some magic number to produce numbers of meals. Hell, they're using a noose, squeezing resources that could have helped more directly, more humanely, simply, and usefully. Some power dynamics. Like greedy grabbing customers at a huge closeout sale, the advocates and distributors fight among themselves and with anyone perceived to stand in their way. They start out by jointly pursuing a new funding program. When it comes, they fight over shares. In New York City, as in some other big cities, there is a coalition linking the service providers with the advocacy operations. Self-interest overshadows concern for poor people. Like others in the industry, they perform the requisite rituals for ending hunger, then move on to the stuff that counts, like getting a bigger cut of the food money for refrigerators or salaries, quicker reimbursement on government contracts, less paperwork. Even when they attempt to confront the contradictions, sooner or later, they get back to basics, like the efficacy rather than the ethics of using slave labor from the welfare department's forced work population. If we all had enough funding, None of us would have to use workfare labor anymore. 
The misnomer for our coalition is the New York City Coalition Against Hunger. Meal counts are a big issue here. The coalition asks the soup kitchens and pantries to tally the number of meals served. The higher the number, the bigger the claim they can make on the public purse. The coalition knows it doesn't get an accurate tally, but a self-designed magic formula to factor in under-reporting, but not over-reporting, allows them to claim ever-increasing numbers of meals served. The coalition boasts some 600 member organizations. The powerhouse behind the discard market in New York is Kathy Goldman. She runs an advocacy operation called the Community Food Resource Exchange, CFRE, which gave birth to many of the other city institutions involved in the same game. Though Goldman probably operates out of misguided good intentions, the consequences of her success and that of others like her around the country have been largely devastating to those living in poverty. One of her pet projects became the creation of CFRE before the creation of CFRE, was the much derided summer feeding program. It was one of the programs that got the biggest laughs at welfare rights type meetings. Women did not want to trot their children halfway across town for lunch when they could have fed them at home. From the early years on, it was riddled with scandal. Money going thither and yon, food rotting in the noonday sun. Goldman was first introduced to me as the champion of the summer feeding program. She was supposed to be an ally, but from the start, I knew anyone could have thought up that boondoggle without showing a hint of remorse, or at least embarrassment, would be trouble. I had no idea how much. The Community Food Resource Exchange wasn't even born yet. In years to come, DWAC would attempt to educate her, but she put up a powerful resistance. One thing Goldman surely had little time or patience for was talking to and understanding the people to whom she seemed to have dedicated her life. I would hazard a guess that to this day she has no idea how ridiculous the summer feeding program is, how few of the poor it actually feeds, how much of the money allocated for it has been, let's say, diverted. In May of 1991, the General Accounting Office issued a report examining the summer feeding program. It begins, most private sponsors, for example, churches and CAPs, were excluded from the program in 1981, in part because of mismanagement. In 1989, they were again given contracts. The report continues, the 10 private sponsors we visited all made errors. One common observation was low participation and over-representation of meals served versus recipients visible. Mismanagement is a word the government uses a lot to mask out-and-out -out fraud they cannot or do not want to prove. The contracts to distribute the food have always had considerable political and, of course, if administered appropriately, financial value. Throughout her career, Gl Goldman has glossed over the self-aggrandizing power dynamics of feeding the hungry. Her continued work was so familiar that Mayor Koch nominated her for a national anti-hunger award given annually by the Pillsbury Company, a sometime board member of Second Harvest. She won. Some advocates and distributors set out to destroy competing operations in the funding sweepstakes. Among them, as the self-anointed monarch of the feeding programs in New York, Goldman would abide no competitors. When the Coalition for the Homeless, for instance, acquired a large grant to operate a familiar program, similar program out of Albany, without her imprimatur, she lost no time gathering forces to oppose it. It went out of business shortly. Fortunately, it was worthless and essentially harmless. Its demise was irrelevant, at least to poor people. When something worked to her advantage, though, she could go the opposite way. During New York's Hands Across America debacle, she coalesced with a vengeance with virtually every element of her ilk to steer the money away from a poor people's agenda and into the hunger crowd's coffers. Others cultivate key legislators and powerful bureaucrats as adroitly as lobbyists anywhere. In Albany, New York, one of the most creative is Russell Sykes, formerly of FRAC, where he earned his pinstripes. He leveraged a sole source contract from the state health department for a toothless operation called the Nutrition Consortium. In turn, the consortium would dribble out bits of half-million-dollar grants, bits of a half-million-dollar grant to smaller groups around the state willing to be kept in Sykes' political orbit. It was supposed to be an outreach program. It pushed paper back and forth. The post office scored big on that one. As for the hungry, the deal was neither tasty nor nutritious. Sykes did not attempt to conceal his desire to wipe out the Hunger Action Network of New York State, a shoestring operation with aspirations slightly more energetic in defense of poor people's interests. As a consequence of Haney's objective attempt to organize poor people into their work, they became more aligned with poverty issues over the years. 
This posed a threat to both Sykes and Goldman, who sullied themselves throwing mud at Hanny's. In one sense, Hanny's is the statewide version of the New York City Coalition Against Hunger, as both are stellar examples of groups where good intentions coupled with serious ignorance had run amok. The Nutrition Consortium appears to be particularly impotent. Sykes' control was so tight that even when he moved from one organization to another, the consortium moved with him. These conglomerates have paid staff. Only one distributes any food. Christina Walker, former director of the Food and Hunger Hotline, who also sat on the board of Food for Survival, put it this way. Just in the four and a half years that I was at the Food and Hunger Hotline, I could see it happen at a very accelerated pace. What must have been underway even before, which was this very serious institutionalization of the discard market. It had gone beyond the institutionalization stage. It was at the stage where defenses were being built, the moats were going up and being filled, and people were going to fight tooth and nail. The first two years I was there, I ran around saying things like, we can't institutionalize, or in 10 years there'll be a disaster. We have to examine our own participation. Two years later, I just shut up. The battle was over before I even got there. An example of the government funding process. As I moved on to work at the State Department of Social Services in 1983, the monster kept up with me. One of my first assignments of significance was to participate in the distribution of several million dollars for food for the poor, which was to be pumped out through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. It was supposed to be a quick turnaround, a one-shot deal authorized by Congress and the President. We were on a hot deadline to get it out to the groups who would use it to help the broadest diversity of poor people. The largest numbers, and as I tried to impose, with the best record of helping swiftly and with dignity. Nancy Travers headed the newly created Homeless Housing Assistance Program, HAP, which was thrown the FEMA bone to divvy up its first assignment. I was on loan because only one other professional was in place in her department. It was unclear to me how Travers landed the HAP job. One thing shortly became absolutely evident. It was not because of her expertise in matters pertaining to poor and homeless people. The task was monumental given the deadline and certain federal rules. For one, we had to send out a request for proposals, RFP, to groups that might be interested in receiving money to do the job. So an RFP had to be created where none had existed, replete with inst instructions, guidelines, applications forms. A notice of the RFP had to be widely published in newspapers. The proposal deadlines meant the nonprofits would have to work quickly. Summer and vacations loomed not far off. Groups called in to complain that the deadline was too close. We could do nothing about that. They called and wrote to say they didn't like the restrictions on the money. This money originally could not be used for equipment such as refrigerators, stoves, and trucks. No salaries could be covered by it either. The money was to trickle down without institutionalizing another bureaucracy to handle it. It was as if somebody in the Reagan administration had come up with the perfect foil for the braggadocio homeless and hunger volunteers. Knowing sooner or later, the organizations would balk if funds were released to feed the poor without a cut for themselves. Almost the second the RFP was on the table, the lobbying began. Unofficially, that is. The phones rang constantly. Travers took calls from selected heavies such as congresspersons. Otherwise, she spent a good deal of her time working with the county-by-county -county map of the state. For New York City, where two-thirds of the poverty population lived, there were lists, neighborhood by neighborhood, including some where virtually no poor people lived. The lists were sort of a who's who in the charity business. That is, those already interfacing with government. Other than those like DWAC, that is. On the deadline date, floods of papers cascaded into our offices. Travers had assigned me the task of drafting an evaluation form. By now, I already had an attitude about the discard market. I could almost care. On May 31st, 1983, I sent her the following memo. Given the speed with which these proposals will have to be evaluated, I'm inclined to suggest the Atlantic City model for our evaluations. To wit, assign each a number and a color, give the roulette wheel a few spins, and award the first 50 winners some money. However we decide to do it, effective dispersal will require more luck than perseverance on our part. It ended, another function of the time factor as I see it, is that only successful paper pushers will have much opportunity to access these funds. Less sophisticated community groups, which are often as able and more sensitive to their neighbors to distribute necessities, will have limited ability to control any of this emergency money, etc. Ms. Travers did not appreciate the humor. Then again, I didn't know how close I was. First, we triaged much of the junk. 
all actual poor people requesting funds were automatically denied. They were advised, usually by me, what they could do, where they could go for help while decisions were made for this trickle-down money to make its way to them. Could the money have landed by design in the pockets of poor people? Of course. In the end, almost none of it did. Some of the junk found its way back into the piles of fundables, no doubt for political reasons. Turns out nobody does much for nothing. Almost all those good things churches and charities brag about are paid for by government, usually on a per capita basis. One proposal from a large New York City agency was almost entirely blank, with only a note explaining they were busy but requested funds and said they would do the right thing with the money. When the final decisions were in, even the phantom application was there on the list with a fat contract. No small community organization could ever have been so brazen and succeeded. More often than not, though, it is the small local groups that are most sensitive to the community, overworked and by God underpaid. The usual suspects, Catholic Charities, the Salvation Army, the United Way, and others in various parts of the state, all got a cut of the loot. Such and such a county had to get X amount of money, even though they didn't have any respectable service agency except the welfare department itself to distribute the food. I tried explaining the futility of that to Travers. The departments would save money for all other items of need, i.e. clothing and utilities, while using the FEMA funds as a dodge from processing welfare applications. Local governments had an additional incentive to use the FEMA funds this way, as these were 100% federal dollars, unlike AFDC dollars, which in New York are 25% local, 25% state, and only 50% federal. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened and worse. Not long after the FEMA funds started flowing into every county on a regular basis, welfare offices all over the place began denying applicants benefits until they had exhausted all available resources. This meant the pantries and kitchens, too. So welfare eligibility determinations were directly affected for countless individuals and families in desperate need. Some of these, without money to pay rent, ended up homeless. Organizations on the receiving end obtained obvious benefits, especially as the funds grew and changed to their advantage. The giving side was a power-building apparatus for the administration, the state agency collectively, and Nancy Travers personally. That was round one. The feds were inclined to believe that states' reporting had been shoddy, that they could not account satisfactorily for funds they distributed. So the following year, the job, which had in part been done by the charities even before, was turned wholly over to an interagency council on the homeless, with FEMA chairing an entity such as the United Way, Catholic Charities, and reputable others pulling the strings both in Washington and at state or local levels. One self-propelling bureaucracy produced another. Having been privy to at least some of the reporting done by local operations to New York City's Interagency Council, I can tell you that the idea that the problem of misreporting has been solved is downright laughable. The one-shot FEMA deal begun in 1983, like the 1981 Temporary Emergency Food Assistance Program, continues to this day. The FEMA-guided budget went from $0 in 1982 to $134 million for 1993, $50 million of which is now for administration to states and localities. No Virginia, there isn't a free lunch. In New York State, SNAP grants flowed from Albany in November of 1984. Thanksgiving was coming, and the governor thought he would look good by loosening the purse strings on soup kitchens. A million and a half dollars quickly followed. The 1990-91 budget for SNAP was $10.8 million, over seven times the original budget. It also split into categories for various populations of purposes, each with different overseers. In the beginning, nearly all the money was designated for the purchase of food. Like a precision drill team, Relevant groups in the state advocated first to establish the program, then to expand it, then to split the money into smaller food shares and larger administrative shares or operational costs. In the last state budget, Kathy Goldman's Community Food Resource Exchange was granted $410,000 from this pot. Only about half was designated for food. Another distinct prototype, soon to be mimicked in city after city, started in 1982. The first so-called Prepared and Perishable Food Program, PPFP, called itself City Harvest. No kidding. Hunger was in, poverty out. 
Waste disposal was as hot an issue in New York as elsewhere. This gem of an idea would bring leftover food from restaurants and Wall Street luncheons to underfed people on the streets. Because it was prepared and perishable, it had to be moved in a New York minute. That was theory, at least. City Harvest would pick up the excess food from some of the finest restaurants in the city and distribute it primarily to operating soup kitchens. For reasons unknown, the concept hit New York like lightning. Between the news coverage, the Page Six gossip following glitzy fundraising events, and the general scuttlebutt among nearly everybody in social welfare, it was hot, hot, hot. Corporate donors, foundations, and individuals tripped over one another to give City Harvest money. It was truly the TSAR, Table Scraps Are Our Right, campaign come to life. City Harvest's founder, Helen Paylett, is the self-proclaimed originator of the concept, which has spread to at least 80 cities and counting. The hype is dynamite. Around Thanksgiving, full-page ads aiming at dollars start appearing in the New York Times. Each of these costs thousands of dollars, as the Times ad department claims to charge City Harvest like any other advertiser. The ads do not show up as fundraising expenses in City Harvest financial accounts to either government sources or any others. Loopholes in reporting laws allow them to count anything that has the least bit of educational value as program expenses. Even those letters you get in the mail asking for your dough during the holiday season can usually be written off as program and not fundraising expenses. That way, when you're trying to figure out how much money an organization spends getting money as opposed to doing the good work it claims to do, you can't tell. Television ads have now been added to the mix. The ads cleverly lure potential donors into thinking City Harvest 2 plays a major role not only in feeding the hungry and homeless, but also in stemming the onslaught of garbage. An environmentalist's dream come true. A match made in heaven poor people in garbage. To the extent that any garbage was kept out of landfills because of City Harvest, it was in the form of biodegradables. Helen Paylett, a mercurial self-promoter, never hinted at the amount of non-biodegradable material City Harvest hypocritically produced for the city's sanitation department. For instance, one queer habit of City Harvest described by former employees was the use of extraordinarily thick, plastic, FDA-approved food handling bags as waste basket liners at every desk to be thrown away each time they filled up. It is not possible to purchase bags as thick as this at any ordinary retail store for any purpose. Besides, City Harvest didn't use any kind of food bags for food. Nonetheless, if the truth be told, 172 cases of these were purchased, even though City Harvest had no sensible use for them at the end of July 1985, according to the organization's documents and statements of former employees. You see, City Harvest, like hundreds of others, was the recipient of FEMA funds, which had to be expended and accounted for by July 31, 1985. As of July 25, 1985, they still had nearly $12,000 sitting in an account, if City Harvest wanted more, the money had to be spent. At least that's the logic nonprofits always give for these year end excesses. So, taxpayers effectively bought nearly $4,000 of plastic, headed almost straight for the dump, in behalf of the appreciative hungry. By itself, $4,000 worth of plastic bags may not seem like much, but when thousands of organizations are playing the same game, waste is endemic. A check dated July 31st, 1985 for $11,711.33 was made out to Kepler Brothers for FEMA supplies and signed by Helen Verduin Pallet. The other items supposedly purchased with this check apparently never arrived at City Harvest. The rest of the money seems to have been artificially accounted for with the aid of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, which handled shaky FEMA accounts for quite a number of discard market organizational clients. Far more serious than the numerous financial indiscretions at City Harvest and other misinterpretations perpetrated in the Times and elsewhere is the question of potential food poisoning of those who do end up eating at least some of the goods. It's about what are called bacteria and how they multiply. City Harvest's food brochures state that the entire operation is run in strict accordance with New York City Health Department guidelines. Not quite. New York's health codes specify a maximum temperature of 45 degrees for refrigerated foods and a minimum temperature of 140 degrees for hot foods. In the area between, bacteria grow like crazy. 
As of August 1991, City Harvest had no refrigerated vehicles and no capacity to ensure appropriately heated temperatures when required either. Because pickups may stay in the van or truck for hours before being delivered, the hazards could be great. Let's face it, if a street person dies, he doesn't get an autopsy the next day to determine cause of death. On a sweltering summer day, it wouldn't take long for soup fixins to become deadly weapons. Even in winter, vehicles shifting between warm and cold would keep temperatures vacillating and poor people at risk. No risk to donors, though. The Good Samaritan Law has them covered. Besides, they're given every reason to believe City Harvest practices are safe. For one, City Harvest tells them that all drivers must successfully complete the Health Department's Food Handlers course, another bit of a fib. To be certified food handlers, participants are required to take a 15-hour course and pass a test. City Harvest drivers take neither the course nor the test. At most, some of the drivers attend a three-hour lecture by health officials. City Harvest vehicles aren't even inspected. These are the good guys. They are taken at their word. City Harvest normally took credit for a good deal of poundage they didn't actually have much to do with. Padding the stakes in both pounds and costs per meal. The more pounds, the less cost. The lower the cost-benefit ratio claimed, the easier to raise money for the operation. For instance, when a driver makes a pickup, in theory he weighs it, but in practice he just signs the donor's written declaration as to weight. If it turns out the goods have to be dumped, it still shows up as a net gain in City Harvest records. Food picked up through the City Harvest system directed directly by other operations would also be registered in City Harvest sums. These were considered so lucrative that internally they were referred to as, quote, goldens. Many of the pickups were not from restaurants or bakeries at all, but were more commonly the leftovers of Wall Street office luncheons or cafeterias. Often it cost more to pick these up than the food was worth, both because the amounts were limited and because the driver might have to wait hours to access the food. As might be expected, many of these Wall Streeters have also made cash donations to City Harvest. Then there's the problem of feeding operations, to which City Harvest will deliver nothing. One open-air kitchen run by homeless people shacked up in a contemporary Hooverville on the Lower East Side was rejected by Paylet as not clean enough. City Harvest staff were so appalled that they took a collection and bought 25 pounds of rice to give. Health issues would be the excuse for turning down less formal operations. Coming from the people who claim prevention of starvation is the health issue they are addressing, the excuse is flimsy at best. Then again, encouraging real community-based grassroots self-help has never been the aim of the discard market. Just because City Harvest looks a little shaky isn't reason to condemn the entire Prepared and Perishable Food Program network. Nevertheless, when there's one, there's two. The self-chosen terminology of the network says it all. The real benefits. It is not surprising that APCO Associates, the consulting group of one of the country's top tax shelter law firms, Arnold and Porter, guide fledgling prepared and perishable food programs along. Steve Farr, an APCO consultant, says they are really growing, achieving a separate identity from food bankers at all. The PPFPs are funded by a broad mix of public and private sources, events, and individuals, depending on the locality. United Parcel Service, UPS Foundation, is the leading contender for the preeminent benefactor award, the PPFPs. On occasion, when other means were not available or reasonable, City Harvest used UPS services to deliver packages outside Manhattan, for which they paid the going rate. The usual tax benefits for donations go to UPS, plus the more of these programs there are nationwide, the more likely it is that they will purchase UPS services. An impressive three-inch thick plastic jacketed technical assistance manual entitled Fighting Hunger with Prepared and Perishable Food was underwritten by the UPS Foundation. It provides a wealth of information in the event you want to start one of these babies. No doubt the hungry appreciate the extras that went along with the production of this loose leaf wonder. As for environmental concerns, it would be hard to exaggerate the amount of wasted material in it. Large type, lots of bullets, heavy pages, most printed on only one side, plastic tabs galore. In addition to advice on getting money and dealing with the media, there's an entire section devoted to understanding liability. Among its altruistic treasures is a reprint of an article entitled Leftovers, The Question of Liability. The subtitle reads, Food donors are, italics in text, protected under the law. The text assures, in all the years since the first Good Samaritan Law passed, 
Not a single case has been reported of an injured party filing suit against a good faith donor. It does not say there have been no injured parties. In the corresponding appendix are letters from various PPFPs to demonstrate mail solicitation decorum. From the Washington, D.C. Central Kitchen Incorporated, a brief paragraph covers D.C.'s version of the do-good law, claiming it provides immunity from both criminal and civil liability to a donor of food when that food inadvertently or even negligently, emphasis added, harms the recipient of the food. I like to think it is needless to write, but just in case, the manual also offers a hefty section on tax deductions. In some cases, the PPFPs carry some food, even some exceptional food, to food kitchens and pantries. Leftover breads from local bakeries are popular, for instance. These could be handled by the existing banking network, and to some degree or lesser degree, already are. But all the expenses and deductions and plain old money spent make no sense when they feed only a fraction of poor people. Very few poor children, a fraction of the time, putting them at risk while washing all other parties' hands of any. With the possible exception of hardened street people and shut-ins who have their own food programs, most poor people, even adult men, do not need these programs to survive. The real beneficiaries of the prepared and perishable food programs, once again, are those who get paid by them get tax deductions, or just get their charitable rocks off without understanding the consequences to those they don't serve. In 1991, a feature item on network TV declared the D.C. Central Kitchen a major success, providing 175,000 meals annually. The approximate number of people below the poverty line in Washington, D.C. at the time was 100,000. Add those who get no benefits and or are homeless, those who, for one reason or another, don't appear in government stats, even with the food banking system stash, is that one and three quarters meals per poor person each year, or 10 to 20 meals per poor adult male? Either way you look at it, the claims and kudos are absurd. It's expensive keeping people poor. The vast panoply of discard food distributors seems innocent enough, perhaps even worthy, until you get up close. They do not make a dent in the need. At the same time, the relentless advocacy for increased funding has had very concrete negative effects on virtually all poor people. The TSAR campaign has had profound consequences. Sooner or later, money flowed from every level of government in most areas. From foundations dizzy on the movement, from wealthy individuals lured by glitzy affairs, celebrity participation, and minimal information. The discard market proponents were birthing little empires and new bureaucracies in the guise of feeding poor children, women, homeless men. Advocates busily whittled away at the restrictions in all the programs. The ratio of program money to operation administration began regressing, even with the federal dough for salaries, for refrigerators, for stoves, for trucks and vans, for warehouses, for... The money was essential to maintaining the ventures, not the food. When volunteers got tired of volunteering, they could just walk away. Paid staff became essential. Without salaries, some distribution sites would not have come into being in the first place. Most would have failed to keep regular scheduled hours so people could line up. Year after year, program heaped upon program, the funding for this once free food market expanded nationwide because year after year, good people went bonkers to help the poor by giving themselves money. In the 1970s, poor people helped one another, as they continue to do, and they did it with far fewer resources and far greater success. In a kind of round robin, neighbors borrowed from one another when the check and food stamps ran out. Their benefits came on different days. Each year, though, it has become harder and harder to get by. Welfare departments and even the food staff program ultimately had a system for giving emergency assistance out, but it was a capricious system, one that could have benefited from heightened consciousness. Had it been the target of the kind of robust, relentless advocacy that produced the discard market, there's no doubt each family, each individual, would have been better off than they are today. As bad as welfare is, if you make it through the labyrinth, you leverage much more than just a half meal or two or a night's lodging. It at least recognizes that people are whole beings with more needs than this alternative could produce, even if it were perfect. Poor people were becoming more poor with every congressional or legislative session that put money in the, the FEMA pot or any of 13 food programs won by the U.S. Department of Agriculture alone. 
Not to mention those tugged out of Health and Human Services, the General Services Administration, or any other federal, state, or local agency for similar purposes. At no time did the obvious question of the increasing povertyization of the people served get any serious consideration. Advocates who bulldozed the cheese didn't even put the key into the ignition regarding income standards. We do not need to build a better food bank or fix the rotten mess in any way. Most people alive eat. Since most poor people are not being helped by this industry, it's obvious that in one way or another, they are accessing food. Must they continue to do so with less and less money? Do we need to increase government spending? Not really. Truth is, billions are pissed away in soup kitchens and the like. Shut them down. At political rallies in the 30s, people carried placards reading, End the bread line, vote Roosevelt. When I was growing up, the bread lines and soup kitchens elicited neither fond memories from those old enough to remember them, nor civic pride. They were cause for national shame, not evidence of our humanity. Not now. How did this happen again? Was it a conspiracy? I doubt it. It was one of those historic moments when too many inappropriate interests converged, producing an effect sometimes referred to as the mobilization of bias. Whether it started in the boardrooms of private foundations, where primarily wealthy men make philanthropic decisions, or the charity balls where wealthy women jockey for status by raising money and throwing great tax-deductible parties, or in government where short-sighted officials attempted to bring expenditures down, or at corporate conferences where the garbage problem seemed to intersect nicely with social responsibility, or with real estate interests that caused the evictions and burnouts of so many poor people, or at the hands of the mob of social welfare professionals holding on to the last vestiges of the great society, or in the newsrooms of journalists who listened to these others and reported it so uncritically hardly matters.